Hi, I'm Randall from Randall's ESL Cyber Listening Lab, presenting and giving ideas on language learning, culture, and human development. And today's topic has been one that has kind of been on my mind for some time. I'd like to get some historical perspective on this as well, uh, because I think we often think about this, but not to a great extent. And I think as human beings, we spend most of our day, well, in the usual things of life, going to work, going to school, making dinner, you know, commuting to and from work. But I think we far we spend far less time on the here and now, you know, what life means to us and also in imparting whatever ideas that we have with our own children, especially if today were the last day of our lives. Now, this is something that uh, back in 2011, I was thinking about a Christmas gift for my children. What could I give to them that would be of great meaning in their lives? You know, what would I share with them? I could give them gifts. I could give them gift certificates. But then I started to reflect on the here and now. Because if today were the last day of my life, I wanted to know what I could share with them that would be of great meaning to them in the here and now. Generally speaking, we don't have the luxury of planning this out, but maybe we should. And I think I, I began to ask myself, what would be some of the most innermost thoughts that I could tell my family, my friends? You might be thinking the same thing. If today were the last day of my life, what could I share with my family beyond I love you? And this is applicable also to our classrooms. And I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little bit about this book. This is the book that I actually created for my children. Again, it is called Chronicles of Everyday Living. What if I only had one day to live? And the reason why I share this with you is that some of the thoughts that I have, I think would be very applicable to teachers in sharing with their students. What are some of the things that would be of greatest value if today were the day, last day of your life? Because in reality, someday it will be. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to share some of the comments that came from this book. Let's call this a, a, a story time where I could share some ideas that would be relevant to you, that would be relevant to your classrooms, to, that would be relevant to your family, and hopefully all of us together. So in doing so, uh, let me just check in who's here. Hon uh, Than, thank you for saying my, oh, I don't know if I'm always saying your name, Hon Than, correctly, but I certainly try to. Uh, Alan from Costa Rica, welcome Alan, and Melvin from Haiti. Uh, great to have all of you here. Well, let's go ahead and get into the presentation. And today, as we talk, what I'd like you to do is think about yourself. How are the ideas that I'm sharing today relevant to you, to your classes, to whatever you might be doing, and uh, how can these ideas be transfers, I guess is what I'm saying as well. And Alan says, I would thank my family and close friends for all the things they have shared with me. And that's what I'd like to hear. What are the things that you would share with your family as well? So let's get right to this. So uh, first of all, what I'd like to do is I'd like to open up the book Again, the book that I share with my kids, and I'd like to actually read some of this with you. And the first idea is about being prepared and thinking ahead. And in the picture you see, I want to kind of preface my remarks by saying, I grew up in the state of Indiana, that is in the Midwestern part of the United States, and the winters can get cold, minus five degrees Celsius, 10 degrees Celsius, 15, even 20 degrees Celsius. And so my first idea to my children was always be prepared. And this is what I'd like to share with you and then connect it to some other ideas and be thinking in what way would this be relevant to your classroom, to your students, to your families as well. Here we go. Over the years, I've realized that doing stupid things, the types of things that lead to natural consequences tend to be part of our everyday human existence and no one is really able to escape this fact. I think we all do stupid things. As a young boy in Indiana, winter wintertime brought with it the joys of playing in the snow 
and hoping school would be canceled because of blizzards. This time of year also presented a number of opportunities to explore the nearby woods. I lived in a neighborhood where there were woods and a, and a creek and a pond nearby. Leading into the pond was a small stream that served not only as a local fishery, we went fishing there in the summer, but also provided the conduit for our white water rafters, uh, white water adventures on rafts after heavy thunderstorms. So often there were thunderstorms and we would jump on rafts and, and go down. I also realize now that the attention span and wisdom of 11 or 12 year old is often about is often about as short as a blade of, gra of grass. And I wasn't exempt from this fact. In the deep winter, I felt one way to demonstrate my manhood as 11 or 12 year old was to cross the frozen stream, having absolutely ha no idea of how thick or thin the ice was because the stream would often um, freeze over. I think my friends and I thought the thinner the ice, the better because the cracking of the ice as you tried to make it across, walking across the ice, of course, that's a really stupid idea, uh, demonstrated an extreme level of courage rather than sheer stupidity. On one occasion, we decided to try swinging across the creek on a rope that was designed for summer fun. In other words, someone put a rope across the stream where people could swing across and drop into the water during the summer but we thought it was a great idea to try this in the winter. Well, what happened is I lost my grip and crashed through the ice. Fortunately, the, ice, the water wasn't that deep and I was able to pull myself out, but it didn't dawn on me at that moment that young boys seem to do the most, most things against good reasoning and judgment. Looking back on that in similar times, I sometimes wonder why in the world I did some of the stupid things that I did. The follies of my youth are too numerous to, to count. And then I go on to tell my own kids, fast forward today, think careful about planning. Plan your lives in a way that you're also you know, making good judgments. Don't let your emotions in the moment cloud your judgment. And someday is not a day of the week. And so when I think about preparation and what I was trying to instill with my own kids is think about preparation and all that you do. And if you make a mistake, just pull yourself out of that icy water and move forward. So I would be interested also in what kinds of things do you share with your students or in your own lives of the idea and concept of being prepared? Because this was certainly something that I didn't do very well. Uh, Melvin says, your advice helps me so much in life. Uh, uh, Nayali says, hello, Mona. I said, greetings. And again, it's great to hear from many of you today. So that is kind of point number one of the idea of being prepared. I wanted my kids also to be prepared. And even the idea of life insurance. I remember when I was 21 years old and I went to college and my father said, one piece of advice that I want to give you is buy life insurance. And I was thinking, you know, 21 years old, who needs life insurance? I'm young. I don't need it. And then I realized later on in life that certainly being prepared, especially in the small things of life, make a big difference. Absolutely. Right. Uh, Alan, great down to earth teaching. Uh, and Mona says, hi, Nayeli. Uh, great to share ideas and greetings with one another. So absolutely. That was point number one in my book. Again, the idea is that I didn't want to, you know, leave some of these things unsaid. The next idea was to pursue lifelong learning, you know, in everything that we do. And I said that in the book, that was the kind of the second point. It says, never start, stop pursuing the finest learning around. This could occur in the kitchen, the backyard garden, uh, along a mountain trail, never, never pass up an opportunity to learn. <clears throat> and what I also wanted my kids to realize too is that always as part of learning, always be open to new ideas, even if new information challenges the ways that you thought about before. For example, as teachers, if you're a teacher and you find a new idea, be open to changing your opinions. Also, 
This deals with in the areas of politics, COVID-19. If you find out new information about that, you're prepared to reframe your beliefs. Uh, teaching, parenting, whatever it might be. I wanted my kids to, there might be certain values and beliefs in your life that you're holding on type with an iron grip. However, if by chance that you learn something new, be willing to let go and adopt new views and perceptions and beliefs about language, about people. I wanted my kids to know that. And throughout my life, the more I've learned, the more I think I've been open to new growth. And one of the things that I, a couple of thoughts I share with my kids is true wisdom is knowing that you know nothing. I mean, it was something like when I was 21, I knew everything. <clears throat> and now that I'm in my 50s, well, I don't think I know anything. In the other words, that we're constantly learning, we're constantly growing as well. Uh, Raphael says, hello. Uh, Nazreen says, knowledge is power and can't ever get taken away. Yes, it can't be taken away. It helps us grow and we should always be open to new information. Alan says, open to mistakes is key to success in life and learn from these mistakes. Absolutely. Along with that, one of my favorite thoughts is, a mind once stretched by a new idea never regains its original dimensions. In other words, sometimes, as Nezreen mentioned as well, you know, when you start learning new things in the classroom, sharing with your students different perceptions about the world and so forth, your mind never goes back to the way it was. And so I wanted my kids always to be open to that type of development. Lele says, I think the first thing we must share with our pupils is emotions. Uh, pupils won't be able to receive from you unless they love you. And I'm going to be talking about that idea as well. Thank you, Leila. Uh, Leila. Kayla from Costa Rica says, yes, lifelong learning is a national necessity, which must be, which be universal. It it's not just a luxury for some people here and there. Absolutely. It's a universal trait that we, sh we should continue to build. Thank you uh, for sharing that, Kaylor. Mona says, yes, long. Uh, oh, that's what Mona said. I'm sorry. That's what Mona said with uh, universal, the universality of knowledge. And Kaylor says, how much life does your salary cost you? At some point, our, our lives, our life, the world of work consumes us. Our, so our, our world of life, our, our, our whatever we do in our workplace often consumes us, especially as teachers. So thank you for sh sharing that, Kayla, because that is true, that our life sometimes at work consumes what we try to do as well. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Yelly says, being prepared to me could be to be able to react wisely to whatever comes to us. I always tell my kids to think about the consequences of their acts. Absolutely. So thank you, Kaylor and Mona and Nayeli for sharing those thoughts regarding learning. So that was the next thing that I shared with my kids is a little bit about pursuing lifelong learning. As Kaylor mentioned, don't let that consume you. Be prepared to learn in new ways as well. So after I shared that particular point, I went on to the next one. Make family and human relationships a priority. And I think this goes back to what Kaylor and, and uh, Mona were say, saying, I believe, is you earn a living by what you, you make a living. I should say make a living. You make a living by what you earn and you make a life by what you give. And to be in your children's or students' memories tomorrow, you have to be in their lives today. And one of the things that I shared in my book with my kids is I said, doing things outside of the box. We did a lot of interesting things outside of the box, you could say. And experiencing the simple pleasures of life based on our kids' interests and desires can build new memories. Too often in our pursuit of worldly recognition from our peers, we often forget that being a hero in the home is and should be our number one priority. And certainly pursuing goals, professional goals are important. I wanted my kids to realize that the home is so important. 
And so that's one of the things that I want, wanted my kids to remember. Remember that family is important. Remember building relationships is important as well. Uh, Mesa says, I like the, your idea of creating such a book. It will forever be an extraordinary mem memory from you to your children. I think it's high time to be prepared for the idea of being grannies and papas. Absolutely. You know, I've been married, well, 30, almost 33 years. And I wasn't thinking, you know, many years ago that I would be a grandfather, but I am today thinking about the now, right now, the power of now, I think is important. Riyadh says, hi, best Randall in the world. Thank you, Riyadh, for hearing, hearing from you from Tunisia. And Melvin says, I lose the feeling to be better by mistakes I made right now. I have desire to be better, but I don't feel it. How may I turn on the feeling again? You know, that's one of the hardest things. And I'm going to talk about Melvin in a few minutes about forgiveness and how that can be reflected back in our making mistakes. Because sometimes our mistakes hold us hostage to our abilities to move forward. And we certainly want to try to do that. Great. So thank you very much for that. Again, so making family a priority. The next idea I wanted my kids to learn about was about being an example. And there were a couple of areas in my book where I talked about having the courage to do difficult things and being an example. And throughout the book, what I did is I included pictures of my family. Here's a picture that uh, you can't really see. That was in Japan. So I tried to include pictures and thoughts for my kids so they could think about all the all the time about love and, and friendship. And I said to my kids about being an example. While parents and be thinking and again, feel free to share how these ideas would be relevant to your own classrooms about emphasizing family. And one of the things that I want to make mention, I know that one of our previous guests, Carol Ceciliano Rodriguez from uh, Costa Rica shared her idea that sometimes the safest place that their students experience throughout the day is often in, within the walls of her own classroom. And I think many of you've shared that or experienced that where students maybe come from very difficult family environments and you are, you know, you serve as the role of a parent, as a friend. And so the idea of being a parent, a friend is so critical to that. So feel free to share your thoughts on that. So the next idea that I wanted to share with my kids was being an example. And I said the following, and uh, these were some of the comments. It is only when we're talking to them that our kids aren't listening. Now think about that. It's only when we're talking to them that our kids aren't listening because the reality is, is that our character and what we do, what we say, say, I'm sorry, what we do roars so loudly like a lion that kids can't hear what we're saying because they're focusing on what we do, not just what we say. So I shared this in the book. It says, while parents tend to administer instruction from the top down, kind of like a teacher as well, okay, we probably should be spending more time listening from the bottom up. Personally, I have found that I can't expect my children to rise to any standard than to the one that I have reached myself. Can you expect your children to be honest if you try to sneak food and drink into a movie theater when the signs clearly posted say it's not prohibited, you can try to justify certain behaviors by saying to your kids, oh, that policy is not important. I'm just bringing in, a, you know, a few apples. But by saying that the policy doesn't make sense or that movie theaters just make tons of money off refreshments, which they do, I think. So your children will do what you do. We honor policies. I tried to teach my kids. We try to honor policies out of respect for the values of honesty and integrity. We might be able to outsmart kids when they're little, but they see the shallowness of our words later on. And so one of the things that I've thought, even in the classroom, when we make a mistake, 
let's say that we're teaching a grammar point and and we don't know how to explain that very well and we tell the students oh that's that's from level 29 we don't cover that in this class and we never talk about it again or we are dismissive of students questions i'm the teacher you're the student you will understand that later on students watch our own actions they watch what we do it's kind of like as i mentioned a few minutes ago what we do roars so loudly that people won't hear what we're saying so i'm interested in hearing what in what way is your example in the classroom how does that impact your students and what they do and how they share and how they grow and how they behave as well toward others couple of ideas nezreem says i love having my students share about their cultures across many topics says such as the importance of family raising children and holidays the idea of sharing i think is it's so important and layla says i'm a good teacher i have an excellent relationship with my students but i'm a bad mom not a good example for my children unfortunately and i think one of the things that i had to ask myself thank you layla for sharing that there were times i think that i listened better to the mailman than I did to my own family. Sometimes it seems like we listen better to strangers than to those that are at the center of our lives. So I think this idea of connecting better with, uh, with students, with family, I think is important. And so feel free to share how and in what role and in what way does being a role model to your students or to your teachers make a difference. So that was a little bit about being an example. I wish I could say, and I wish my children could even chime in and say, Dad, there were certain things that you did well. There were other times that you didn't. Hopefully, we're constantly moving forward. And Melvin, I'm going to come back to your comment because you talked about mistakes. I'm going to bring that back up in a few minutes. The next topic also, one of the things that I wanted to be an example is to teach my children, to teach my students to stand up for those who feel marginalized for their differences, whether it be differences uh, in the ethnicity, uh, religious differences, political views, religious views, um, uh, gender inequality, um, any of those areas where often students in our classrooms may feel on the margin socio socioeconomically, and what do we do to stand up for them to prevent the ideas of bullying? And I know that Mona, well, in one previous episode, Mona is from uh, Tunisia, and she shared her activities in her classroom about encouraging students to be aware of differences and to avoid bullying. And so you as a teacher have to stand up for students in so many ways. Uh, the next thing is I wanted to share with my kids some marital advice. Now, I wish I could be a perfect example of this in the sense that, you know, when you get married, you're thinking about love, love, love. It's kind of like, you know, you think that life will be all bliss. But there's a reality that I think all of us have experienced levels of difficulty, no matter what they might be. They could be dealing with financial issues. They could be dealing with children. They could be doing dealing with health. And so what I wanted my kids to always do is to marry up. And I'll, I'll explain how this is related even to the classroom. I said, what marriage, I had a page right here. I had a page and it was things to know about dad. And one of the things I shared with them was what marital advice would you give to your children? And this is what I might say. Well, my kids have heard it all. When you're young, people are attracted by looks, but without real substance of character, relationships won't last. If you want to marry a Porsche, and now this is not my original idea. I heard this a number of years ago. If you want to marry a Porsche, don't marry a Volkswagen bug and then expect it to turn into a luxury car. Marry someone with high moral standards that won't waver when things get tough. Don't marry a project. And what I meant by this, I think all of us are a project. All of us are growing. But one of the things that I think this is related to the classroom is that I always encourage students to surround themselves with people who make them feel good for being themselves. 
And I think also we have to learn to reach out to also people who may be a little bit different. I think that is key to good relationships, but also find people and surround yourself with people of emotional, of intellectual and in, of integrity that will actually help you marry up. Because the reality in marriage is that a drowning man never reaches down for help. He always you know, reaches up. And so I always encourage my students, I encourage my children to marry up, to associate with peer, people that bring them up. Um, we have uh, Odles from uh, from Mexico. Help me pronounce that correctly. Uh, uh, Nazreem says, Layla, I'm sure you're an excellent mom and we're always judge ourselves harshly. harshly. And Nazreen, thank you for saying that because I know that Layla, you opened up. It's kind of like, I think all of us wear a mask of inauthenticity and I appreciate and thank you Nazreen for jumping in is sometimes when we become more vulnerable and opening up to others, we're not sure how people will respond. But Layla, I'm guessing just like me and you and so many people, we do the best we can. So th thank you for sharing that personal story. I think that's important. And for Nezreen to jump in there. Hana, good morning as well. Layla says, my children left me. It's hard. They think I'm too strict. And I think we're all learning along the process of life. All right. Don't marry a project. I like that, Mona. Yeah, I, I, I just really think that's important. I think we're all projects, but don't, don't marry a Volkswagen bug expecting it to turn out to be a Porsche. Maybe it will evolve into one, but we want to always uh, marry up. And Isra, thank you, Isra, from the United Arab Emirates of joining. So when I think about that, again, marrying up is important. And in the classroom, have students surround themselves with people who make them feel good for who they really are. And I think you can foster that as a teacher as well. The next thing is life isn't fair. I remember my kids said, dad, life sucks. And I said, what else is new? And this is one of my favorite quotes. Expecting the world to treat you fairly because you're a good person is like expecting a bull not to attack you because you're a vegetarian. Well, that's not going to happen. Problems happen. And I think even in the classroom, as we're working with students and students sometimes come from very difficult circumstances. And I think even uh, with, um, with teachers, Sometimes, you know, let's say your boss asks you to teach another class. You find that, uh, you know, the working hours are, are just unagreeable to you. Now you're working online and using all kinds of different technologies that you have no idea how to use. They work 20% of the time. Well, life just isn't fair. And I think just saying to people life isn't fair, just get over it, doesn't validate the real struggle that people have. So let me share with you, this was in, again, throughout the book, I shared pictures of my family, but this is one of my favorite quotes. This comes from a journalist. This was actually written a number of years ago by a journalist named Jenkins Lloyd-Jones. And I think this is a perfect example of what I'm trying to emphasize with life isn't fair. And he uses the analogy of life being an old locomotive. Let me read this. There seems to be the superstition among many thousands of young who hold hands and smooch in the drive-ins that marriage is a cottage surrounded by perpetual hollyhocks, which is a type of plant, beautiful flowers, a bush, to which a perpetually young and handsome husband come home to a perpetually young and ravishing, uh, ravishing wife. So a, a young, dashing man comes home to a ravishing uh, wife. And when the hollyhocks and flowers wither and boredom and bills appear, divorce courts are jammed. Divine discontent is okay within reason. For most human beings, it is the result of not achieving it. It's not the result of not achieving happiness, but of pursuing it. The whole thrust of advertising is to make us unhappy with what we've got and eager for something else. So we have this image that everything is going to be great, everything is going to be wonderful, and then we realize it doesn't. Then he goes on to this idea about the locomotive. Anyone who imagines 
that bliss is normal is going to waste a lot of time running around shouting that he has been robbed. Most putts in golf don't drop. Most beef is tough. Most children grow up to just be people. Most successful marriages require a high degree of mutual toleration. Most jobs are most often dull than otherwise. Life is like an old time rail journey. Some delays, sidetracks, smoke, dust, cinder, and jolts interspersed only occasionally by beautiful vistas and thrilling bursts of speed. And this is the, the climax of this idea. The trick is to thank God for letting you have the ride. Be thankful. Just be thankful that you have the ride of your life, even when things get really difficult throughout. And I think that is important to also. Uh, but the culture is the main factor in marrying nature. Well, there might be that as well, certainly. Uh, that can be connected as well. And then love from Vietnam. So again, the idea of life is hard, life can be difficult, but, and, and I think most things are really difficult in life, but being enjoying those small times when we see those beautiful vistas can be really key. The next thing, and this goes back to Melvin, your idea, and maybe Layla, sometimes forgiving others and yourself. And one of my favorite quotes was, he who does not forgive breaks the bridge over which he must cross someday. We all make mistakes, I think greatly, and we do so in so many ways. And one of the things that I shared in my book was about forgiveness. And it says, forgiving others and yourself. Forgiving others and yourself, I think, is one of those keys in all that we do. Without fail, you will unfortunately do or say something that will hurt the feelings of others. And this can happen in the classroom. This can happen among colleagues. This can happen among teachers and their boss. And I say, I haven't mastered how to avoid this one yet, but I have learned that there is a reason why we were born with two ears and one mouth. So we don't torpedo relationships with others. And so the idea when I start thinking about relationships and why they're important and being, you know, ex expecting, not only expecting ourselves where we can to forgive others, but also forgiving ourselves when things don't go the way they do. Because in life, generally, things don't go the way they do in so many ways. So being open, telling my kids to forgive themselves, forgiving others. Don't hold on because if we hold on to past pain, sometimes we remain shackled to that experience and trying to let go, I think, is so important. Uh, Nazreem says, my father always said that life isn't fair and there's someone always worse off than you. Thank you. I think that is true. Mona says, it's about staying positive and being grateful for what we have. Absolutely. Any Anytime that life is difficult, just hold on. Uh, Ube from uh, Philippines, I will remember that. Being thankful to for God to letting me take the ride, yeah, I think can be very important uh, in, uh, in all we do. I want to have that book. You know what? I, it was a limited edition, but certainly... You know, there might be different ways in which I might share, share that. And so, if Mel Melvin, you shared earlier about mistakes. I think trying, I'm not saying it's easy to let go of the past, but I think it's important to do all we can to try to do so. And to live and learn and let others live is important as well. So uh, let me go ahead and kind of close out with a couple of more ideas. And this is one of the ideas that I really want to share is live for others. And this is a picture right here of me and my grandson. We're walking along and my grandson, he's not thinking about tomorrow. He's not thinking about his Zoom lesson in a week from now. He's not thinking about paying the bills. He is living in the here and now. And in what ways can we live in the here and now for those people around us as I think the greatest lesson that we can learn of anything and helping our students, helping other teachers live in the here and now so that we focus on the here and now in assisting and helping others is so key and important. 
Um, the last thing I want to share along with the same idea is, is miracles do happen. And however you might define that, I think often miracles happen through the help of others that we often are thankful and blessed because of the impact and contribution and emotional influence of others. And sometimes some people have said be, remaining positive. And one of my ideas in remaining positive is this. Two men looked out the same prison bars. One saw the dirt and the other saw the stars. Trying to remain positive, even in the most difficult situations, I think is so key for whatever we do. And, and everything we do uh, is what we uh, certainly are trying to aim at. Well, let me close out with sharing with you uh, a last thought. This comes from Steve Jobs and uh, our son, Joshua. He loves Steve Jobs. Anything that was related to Apple, to Pixar was just... Uh, you know, amazing for my son. My son would write him letters, you know, thanking him for the new computer designs and the new iPods. But one of the things that I really enjoyed was this. And this kind of is kind of a, a summation of what I've been talking about up to date. And Steve Jobs said the following in a commencement address. Uh, you can actually find this on YouTube. It's available. But he said the following in a commencement address in uh, 2005 at Stanford University to the graduating class, he said the following. When I was 17, I read a quote that went something like this. If you live each day as if it were your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. It made an impression on me. And since then, for the past 33 years, I have looked into the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I'm do about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days, I know that I need to change something. Remembering, I'm sorry, remembering that I'll soon be dead is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, all these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking, thinking that you have something to lose. You're already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. And then he continues and concludes. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be because death is, the, is very likely the best innovation of life. It's, life. it's life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. New. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of other people's opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. So he says, time is limited. Don't waste it living someone else's life. And so one of the things that I was trying to share today is the idea of, of just making a difference, making a difference in our children's lives by you know being an example, by living with integrity, by being prepared, by seeing that we don't know what tomorrow brings. So today, live your life. Show your students what is important in their lives. Be an example. Show integrity and so forth. And I think those are the things that make the most of importance in all we do. Uh, Nayeli says, my brother and I always think about people we know that have great lives with no effort and how hard life has been to us and we feel bad. But then we think we should feel proud of ourselves for holding on and being thankful for what we have achieved and be thankful for the efforts. Absolutely great point uh, of being grateful. Alan says, persistence is whatever you do. Um, whatever you do is the miracle. 
to get what you're looking for in the end, right? What you ever in you envision in life, I think is important. So persistent, so important. And Nayeli says, Randall, you are a great role model. I admire you. Thanks for sharing your book and life experiences and your knowledge. And I think what I'm trying to do. And I love Woody and Buzz joining us in the background. You can see them right sitting behind me. And that is what life should be about in so many different ways of connection. Amona says, living for others. 20 years ago, I was standing penniless in the nearby town. I didn't have money for the next taxi ride home. So I waited for a miracle to happen. A taxi pulled over and the man said, I will take you home. And I said, I don't have time. He said, I won't leave you here alone and it's getting dark. He did take me home and refused to receive money and even offered me food. I will never forget that man in my life. All right. And thank you, Mesa, for saying distinguished episode. And I think those ideas of making an impact on others, because really in life, people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think all of your comments have been really moving and sharing those things. Again, the book, Chronicles of Everyday Living, uh, is I think what I wanted to share with you today. And I'm hoping that these ideas will be some things that will resonate also in your life, but in your classroom. Again, being an example, being prepared. Uh, some of you have talked about being positive in all we do. Uh, don't expect life to be perfect because difficult things tend to happen all the time. And I really know that is what happens. And Samea says, thank you, Randall. This, uh, uh, thank you, Randall. This what I do to be an example, a good one for my children and my pupils. Yes, absolutely, Samea. Uh, being a good example for your children and your pupils is something that I was trying to emphasize today. Again, as we're going through the comments, if I don't pronounce your name correctly, I appreciate you sharing your vulnerability and saying, I'm going to put a comment out there. I'm hoping that Randall will share that because your voices are what make this broadcast important for me and for everyone that is watching. So as we conclude this episode, I want to thank you for listening and for being part of this vibrant online community. Uh, this is what makes be going online and sharing ideas so important to me. Also, feel free to get in touch with me through Facebook. I will have more information with the new and upcoming Swap Shop. That will happen in October. I'm working on a topic today. So again, thank you very much. Have a great day and an even better tomorrow.